It is Wednesday, October 5th, and we are here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad that you're here, and we will be in Genesis chapter 18 tonight. So if you want to be finding your way there, that would be awesome, and we'll be ready to study Genesis chapter 18 in just a few moments. And we would also invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a time of Bible study. We are in the book of Isaiah. It's been a very interesting, very good class with good discussion, and hope you you can join us there for that at 9.30 at our church facility, 302 Acewood Boulevard on the east side of Madison, and then 10.30 for worship as well. We hope you can be there. And if you have any questions about what you see or hear at our class tonight, uh, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. Or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, and we'll put those numbers on the screen in just a little bit if they aren't already. But we would love to hear from you. On my recent travels, I attended a so-called Bible class uh, where it took 40 minutes before we actually got to the Bible. And I won't embarrass anybody by mentioning where this was. Great people. The teacher did the very best that he could. Uh, but people had come together to study the Word of God. And the class started 15 minutes late. We shared a bunch of meaningless stuff for a while, followed by a whole bunch of, what do you feel about this or that? And we were 40 minutes into our allotted Bible class time before we actually opened a Bible. And that is not good. I experienced many good things, many encouraging things on my trip across the country over the past several weeks, but this was a learning experience in a bad way. And if you are one of the few people watching this class tonight, I absolutely want to honor and respect the time that you have dedicated to this by actually looking at the Word of God. So tonight we're back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings written by Moses. Up to this point, since I've been away for a few weeks, I should mention in this book so far we've seen the creation followed by the fall with Adam and Eve being kicked out of the Garden of Eden for the sin they committed. We then had the first murder, and we looked at the great flood as Noah finds grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. He builds an ark, he was saved, and so on. We saw the earth then divided by language, and then we're introduced to a man by the name of Abram in chapter 12, maybe at the end of chapter 11 perhaps, and he obeys God. He's called by God to leave his homeland, to travel to a land that God will show him along the way. You may remember God promises Abram a son, but since Abram and his wife Sarai are already quite old, we then have several chapters where Abram and Sarai basically try to find a workaround and try to find some way to help God out a little bit with that promise, which of course causes all kinds of trouble. Uh, God, though, renews the promise to Abram and Sarai several times, and in Genesis chapter 17, where we left off a few weeks ago, uh, God appears to Abram when he is 90 years old. He institutes the practice of circumcision. God changes their names to Abraham and Sarah in chapter 17, and God very specifically says that by this time next year, Sarah would give birth to a son and that they would call his name Isaac. So this brings us to Genesis chapter 18. We're looking at the actual word of God. Hope you can have this open in your own lap or on your own device. We'll have it on the screen for those of you who are able to join us on the video. But we're coming tonight to Genesis chapter 18, the first reference to cheese curds in the Bible. So an awesome thing here in Wisconsin's capital city, the first reference to cheese curds in the Bible. And let's jump right into it. This is Genesis chapter 18. Let's look at verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk 
and the calf which he had prepared, and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Now, we aren't told exactly when this happens in time sequence, but it must have been within just a few months at the most from what just happened in chapter 17. So Abraham and Sarah are in their tent. Abraham is at the door of the tent. Sarah is on the inside of the tent. We find that this takes place in the heat of the day. I've read that with the heat over there, it was common to work in the morning and again in the evening, but that they would often just rest for a little while in the afternoon, in the middle of the day, until the heat passed, uh, when the heat was at its worst. So maybe that's what's going on here. We don't know. This is just based on the cultural context and what we know from history at the time. But in the heat of the day, Abraham sees these men coming uh, through, you know, or coming out of the desert or wherever he was there. We know he was in a drier place than Lot was. So they're, they're coming through, they're passing through the area. And it seems to me that Abraham must not have had too many visitors, at least based on the way he reacts to these three men. So he runs out to meet them along the way. He bows down. He addresses one of these men as Lord. This isn't the word Yahweh that we sometimes have translated here as Lord in the Old Testament. Uh, but this is just kind of a generic word, Lord, a term of respect. Uh, it would be translated elsewhere as master. So a term of respect toward a stranger, maybe similar to how we might use the word sir. Uh, but one of these men apparently seems to be the leader, seems to be in charge of the others. There, there's a leader in the group. And I say this because we have three men. But Abraham seems to address his comments primarily to one of the men. At this point, Abraham, as the head of the family, welcomes these men into his tent, and suggesting that they stop for a little bit, that they allow their feet to be washed, that they rest, that they eat some bread. They do this out there under the tree, in the shade of the tree. They agree to this, and Abraham sets the plan in motion. So he goes inside, he asks Sarah to get some bread started, and I would just note this is not uh, the rundown to quick trip kind of bread, but this is completely from scratch, isn't it? isn't it? So this would have taken a while. This is a long process. This isn't something you whip up in a few minutes. And Abraham doesn't just have Sarah prepare this meal on her own. It's not a matter of saying, hey, go do this and take care of it while I lounge here with our visitors. But notice that Abraham personally goes out as well, and he grabs a choice calf and then he gives this to his servant to prepare it from there. So Abraham takes curds and milk and the calf that has been prepared, and he presents this meal uh, to his traveling guests. Um, I don't want to spoil this for us. I think most of us who are together for this class tonight, we pretty much know what uh, comes next. Uh, but it seems that this act of hospitality is referred to again in the New Testament over in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2 where the author says, let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. The word hospitality, as it's used there in Hebrews 13, comes from the word philoxenia. And I think we've heard of the word xenophobia, haven't we? Xenophobia. Xeno refers to strangers. Phobia, of course, is a, a reference to fear. And so xenophobia then is a fear of strangers or a hatred of strangers, as we might understand that term today. So if someone is xenophobic, what does that mean? It means they don't like strangers. They don't like outsiders. They don't like people who speak another language or people from another country or something like that. That's xenophobia. Well, hospitality in the New Testament is literally the opposite of that. So instead of xenophobia, uh, philoxenia is a love of strangers. So the exact opposite of xenophobia. So uh, philoxenia, the love of strangers. And that's absolutely what we see here in Abraham. So these three men walk in out of the desert. Uh, Abraham welcomes them like long lost friends of the family, offering to wash their feet, preparing this huge feast right there on the spot. And the author of Hebrews uses this as motivation. Instead of fearing, instead of hating strangers, uh, we are to follow the example of Abraham by demonstrating our love for strangers. Not just by talking about it, but by actually inviting people into our home and sharing meals with them. And I would say we do this for the brethren. Notice if you were looking at that passage in Hebrews chapter 13. In other words, we treat our fellow Christians as if they are our respected guest, even as strangers might be. And I know it's very easy to treat outsiders better than we treat each other. 
Uh, that's true in families, isn't it? We can be in a fight with somebody in our own family, an argument of some kind, and a stranger calls on the phone and we answer very politely. If you know what I'm saying there, maybe you've been in that situation, but I'm saying that's also true within the Lord's church. And so the author of Hebrews says you are to treat your brethren as respected strangers. You are to invite them into your home, do whatever needs to be done, and so on, making this special effort to practice hospitality. Um, I might not make bread from scratch. I might not kill the fattened calf. Uh, I may or may not wash your feet. I suppose if that's what you need at that time, we may uh, may have to talk about that. But I'm just saying there are many ways to do this. Uh, taking somebody out to Culver's, dropping off a meal, helping with a car repair, and so on. Uh, one of the greatest um, illustrations of this, I remember growing up and being invited into somebody's home. Uh, I think they were new Christians, very poor, and uh, had us over for frozen pizza. You know, the, the $3 quick trip urge pizza from many years ago or whatever it was. It does not have to be an expensive meal that we share. Uh, but it is the love, the concern behind it, obviously, that counts the most. Uh, I would make note of my, uh, my in-laws. I have some awesome in-laws. My mother and father-in-law uh, really impressed me, made an impression on me when uh, I gave my wife, my future wife, a ride home from college. And so we were leaving Tennessee. I had the car crammed with people. It was a 1989 Honda Civic Si. We had every seat full. And we left after the last person had their last final, which I think was like at 7 o'clock on a Thursday night, if I remember correctly. We all five got in the car, drove north. Uh, Rantoul, Illinois was our first stop. And if you can imagine, 7 p.m. leaving Tennessee, heading north to Rantoul, Illinois. I don't know what that is, six, seven, maybe eight hours. So we were there in the middle of the night with a carload of people. And my future in-laws had the spread. And uh, they had fresh bread they had meat and cheese and mayo and uh, mustard and all kinds of stuff laid out there on the kitchen table when uh, all of us pulled in in the middle of the night and that uh, that just made a great impression on me very hospitable people and it was a good learning experience and a motivational for me in future years but i'm just saying abraham does the same thing these three strangers come in and he literally kills the fattened calf has his wife prepare bread and so on at a moment's notice well, we close this passage with Abraham standing by these men under the tree as they ate. And I was kind of reading, it's kind of weird, right? If you, you know, I have you over and I stand while you eat, that's a little strange. I think you may wonder about that. But apparently in the ancient world, that was the custom where the uh, host would stand. And obviously, if you're standing, you're like a waiter, like a server, and you're ready to go get stuff. Uh, speaking of that, I think the, uh, I haven't looked this up lately, but the word for deacon, uh, ultimately goes back to an idea of uh, like around the table kicking up dust. So the idea of a server just running around doing stuff, looking for opportunities to serve, jumping in, got the towel over your arm uh, in the old kind of way we might think about that. But a server, that's what a deacon is. And that seems to be what uh, Abraham is doing here, standing by ready to do whatever needs to be done. And this is where this account really starts to get even more weird than it is already. So let's continue tonight with Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 through 15. Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 through 15. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, There, in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. In verse 9, the men ask Abraham very specifically about his wife. And that's a little bit of a, of a strange question, isn't it? I mean, first of all, they know her name. But secondly, they're interested 
in her very specifically. They want to know where she is. And then notice in verse 10 as well, one of these men, the I in this passage, predicts that he will return at this time next year and Sarah will have a son by that time. Well, at this point, Sarah is in the door of the tent or, you know, kind of right inside the door of the tent, listening to all of this kind of eavesdropping on this conversation. And she laughs to herself. And she laughs because both she and Abraham are too old for this. Okay. She's past childbearing years. That time of her life is over. And she's kind of thinking to herself, am I going to have pleasure? Because my husband's kind of past that as well. And uh, we're kind of beyond that at this point in our relationship. Uh, in the previous chapter, we learned Abraham is 99 years old. And uh, it's kind of interesting. We had a reference in, on our uh, Sunday sermon, didn't we? About a guy 99 years old being baptized. Kind of an interesting uh, coincidence. But uh, Abraham is the age of that guy that we saw in the picture at uh, church on Sunday. And so we know from a previous reference that Sarah is about 10 years younger, making her about 90 at this point, depending on exactly when her birthday was. Now, this is where this passage gets even more strange. In verse 13, the text refers to the Lord. And in the New American Standard Bible and in most modern translations, the all caps on this means that Moses uses the word Yahweh, uh, sometimes also translated as Jehovah. So this is God talking here. God, God. This is his actual covenant name, Yahweh. And so we start this chapter with three men, one of them appearing to be in charge. Uh, and now we have this man, one of the three men, speaking as God himself. And God's question here is, why did Sarah laugh? And so God then has heard what Sarah said to herself. And I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but to me this sounds quite a bit like Jesus. Remember in his ministry, several times he would answer people's thoughts. People would think to themselves this or that, and Jesus would answer this uh, comment that they were making in their own mind. Uh, I'm thinking of Luke 7, 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman, uh, what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. And I just want us to notice there, Simon says something to himself, doesn't he? But Jesus answers Simon's thought. That is bizarre, isn't it? That is a little bit creepy. It's unnerving. And uh, in the same way, though, the Lord God hears what Sarah has said to herself, and then he calls her out on it by asking, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And God repeats the prediction about a son, and now Sarah chimes in, denying what she had done. I did not laugh, you know, thinking she can get away with it. This is just something I did to myself. And God replies yet again, not letting her off the hook, but God says, no, but you did laugh. And so just what an amazing exchange between God and Sarah here. And I'm thinking she probably kept that in mind over the next several months. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 18, verses 16 through 21, the next paragraph. Genesis 18, 16 through 21. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Well, I think we would say this paragraph is also a rather unusual. The men so-called men, we're going to learn later in the next chapter that there are angels or messengers of God of some kind. But these men, they get up to leave. They look down on Sodom. Abraham is escorting them out. So he's kind of walking with them along the way a little bit. And the Lord almost seems to ask himself whether he should hide what he's about to do from Abraham or whether he should give Abraham a heads up here. Kind of reminds me of Genesis. Let us make man in our image. So God is speaking to himself perhaps in a way here. And so God is reasoning with himself, reasoning through this. Ultimately, he decides to reveal something to Abraham. 
And the reason is Abraham has been chosen to command his children, to command his household, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. And I know we've referred to this uh, period of history as the patriarchal age. Uh, That's the idea that God communicated primarily through heads of households. And that's what we see here, isn't it? Abraham is a patriarch. He is a father. He is in charge of his family. He's the head of his household. And his job is to make sure that those in his family are following the Lord. And I know we're not in the patriarchal age today, but that seems to be a good lesson for uh, us as parents and particularly for men today. If you've got a Christian man in your family, a lot of this falls on him to lead the family in God's way. So God then opens up and he explains to Abraham that there is a huge issue with his neighbors down in Sodom and Gomorrah, that their sin is exceedingly exceedingly grave. And God is about to go down there, about to check it out for himself. And he's basing this on the cry that he's heard. So I don't know. It almost seems like there were a few righteous people who were saying, hey, God, help us. This is terrible, that kind of thing. And God is about to go down there and kind of verify that report. So that's kind of weird too, isn't it? And I know I'm thinking if if God is God, he already knows how bad it is down there. Uh, But as it is in this passage, God wants to, I think we might say, experience it for himself. He wants to go down there in the flesh, so to speak, uh, before he destroys these cities for their sin. He actually wants to walk among them, wants to see if it's as bad as he's heard. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. It's a little bit large, but it's all the same thought here. Genesis 17, verses 22 through 33. I think as we read through this, you'll understand it was really hard to find a place to uh, chop this in half. So it kind of all goes together. But Genesis chapter 18, uh, verses 22 through 33. Genesis 18, 22 through 33. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. He spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the forty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. And I shall speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the twenty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. And I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. So as the men turned to leave, uh, what they're planning to do seems to sink in a little bit. And so God clues in Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go check it out. And Abraham realizes that God is about to wipe these cities off the face of the earth. He probably also realizes that his nephew Lot is down there along with however many people are in his family, maybe those that he's had influence on through the years. So Abraham approaches God and he says, will you indeed sweep away the righteous and the wicked? In other words, it doesn't seem fair. It's not right, it's not fair to just sweep away the righteous with the wicked. And so Abraham then makes a proposal. And his suggestion is that if 50 righteous people can be found, that God will spare the entire city. And God agrees to that, and he agrees to that rather quickly, doesn't he? And at this point, I'm seeing the the wheels are turning in Abraham's mind, and he's probably having some regrets. Ooh, I should (laughs) have. I think I started too high. You know, my grandfather was a steel salesman, and I remember he always told me, 
uh, when negotiating, you always allow the, the other person to make the first offer. You know, their offer may be better than what you were going to start with, for one. And if you say something, then you'll never know. So always have the other person go first in a, in a negotiation. I think you know Abraham's probably thinking that as soon as he spits out this number 50. Oh, no, he was a little too fast in accepting it. So if I've got an old beater of a used car and I put it on the uh, Facebook marketplace and ask 10000 and I got 20 people within two minutes uh, offering me full price. What am I thinking? I should have asked for 15000 right? I, I was too low in my offer. And so here, Abraham has set the bar too high. And instead of, I find it interesting, instead of going down to 10, he steps it down not even by 10, but he subtracts 5. And I don't know if that's significant. I guess it is, since we're looking at it as in Scripture. It's recorded here for a reason. But he backs it off only by five, and he says, you know, will you destroy the city on account of only five? Well, it's not five, it's 45, but that's the way he negotiates this. So it's kind of how they negotiate things in the ancient world, apparently. So it goes down to uh, from 50 to 45, and, uh, and then they very uh, cautiously, Abraham goes in, he respectfully comes back with another kind of counter offer. You know, what if we... Uh, miss that by five. So he takes it down to uh, from 50 to 45 to 40, then to 30, then to 20, and then finally to 10. And he's just falling all over himself in respect for the Lord all through this. You know, I, I dare not approach you. I am but dust and ashes. You're God. I'm not that kind of thing. And God agrees. And that's where we leave it. God will not destroy the city if he can find only 10 righteous people. And that's kind of the end of this paragraph. That's where we leave it for now. In terms of practical applications, I think we've got a couple. We've got the lesson on the importance of hospitality, don't we? Repeated several times in the New Testament. We've got Abraham as our example, and even included in the qualifications of elders. Elders must be hospitable. They must love strangers, even to the point where they serve as examples to the church. In other words, the church should be able to see the elders being hospitable, and they should be able to say, I want to be like that. So not that the elders are perfectly hospitable, but they need to serve in a hospitable way, in a way that they can lead by example. And I think that is a very good reminder for the whole congregation, but especially a good reminder for those of us as elders. All of us are to be hospitable. Elders are to be hospitable to the extent or to the degree that they can serve as examples. The other practical application here comes in Abraham's appeal to God to save Sodom. I know in a sense this isn't Abraham's problem, is it? I mean, Lot, after all, took the more fertile land. Remember that a few weeks ago in our study? Left his older uncle, who probably had more flocks and herds, with the dumpy land, the desert, the dry, arid land. He took the green land. And it would have been so easy for Abraham to have said here, too bad, so sad. You know, he took the good land. That's what he gets. He took the land with the evil cities in it. However, Abraham intercedes and he steps in and he says something. And that, that seems to be a very practical lesson here. God has promised to judge the world and he will. But that certainly doesn't stop us from stepping in and asking God for mercy on behalf of others. So let's take this as a reminder that we need to be praying for those who are lost they may not have the relationship with God that we do, but we do have that relationship. And we can pray for them uh, even when they may not be praying for themselves. So we can go to God on their behalf. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930, getting back to Isaiah. And then after class on Sunday, we plan on coming together at 1030 for the worship assembly. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, once again we have seen tonight that you are a God who sees and hears, even knowing our private thoughts. We're thankful for your promises, even when we doubt, even when we stumble and fall. God, thank you so much for saving us, even from ourselves. Tonight, Father, we pray not only for ourselves, but we pray for those we know who lo and love, who even strangers don't know you. And we pray for opportunities to teach. We pray for opportunities to demonstrate your love, doing for others just as we would like others to do for us. Based on this passage tonight, we also pray for wisdom as we lead our families. Bless us as we practice hospitality. Thank you for blessing us with resources far above and beyond what we actually need, allowing us the ability to share. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus we pray. 
Amen.